This is Johnny Dosco. Stay tuned for another score sheet podcast. Holy Kadelka. Hello, and welcome to another score sheet podcast. Today we have with us Rob Gordon. I've known Rob for many years, mainly through the Arizona Fall League conferences I go to, and he has been the minor league analyst for Baseball HQ for over 10 years now. How are you today, Rob? Good, Jeff. Thanks for having me on the show. Hey, talking to you is great. The uh, It's kind of amazing. I was thinking back to just today when I was thinking about this podcast, that back when HQ started and Scoresheet started, both of which was about 26 years ago, you know, minor right. league information was pretty much non-existent. Yeah, it was pretty hard to come by. I think, you know, you had to, you had to dig pretty deep to find any information at all. Yeah, there was the Baseball America, but for whatever reason, it's never been a, a hugely distributed book. So, yeah, you, I know back then about all I did was I knew the Giants' top two prospects, and maybe I knew about someone like A-Rod, and that was about it. Yeah, and, and even then you didn't really know how to put, the, you know, put things in context necessarily. No, you had to read some scouting report, and the scouts, of course, would always tout their guy right. like he was the next Willie Mays. Right. Yeah, but now, uh, it's if you play in keeper leagues, which two-thirds or maybe more of the score sheet leagues are keeper leagues now, and an awful lot of rotisserie and other fantasy leagues are keeper leagues, I mean, if you almost can't name the starting shortstop for every double-A team, you're almost at a disadvantage. Yeah, I know you really have to know pretty much at least the top ten for each organization if you're playing in a keeper league just to know how you know what's the directory to the next you know future impact player that's coming up and how long is that going to be and what staff to look for and how does the organization view their prospects do they move them up aggressively or are they going to come you know be more like the Tampa Bay Rays where they move them up more slowly and really you know planning what's the next wave for your for your keeper team you know you have to have those guys in line otherwise you're in trouble. Yeah, because it's it's hard to get guys once they become established. You know, you try to trade for Mike Trout right now, you're pretty much got to trade your whole team away, and even then you might not get him. So, you know, you brought up an interesting point. Are there a couple of organizations that you think do a better, much better than average job of actually teaching their minor leaguers how to succeed at the major league level? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely think so. I mean, you look at some like the Cardinals organization. How long have they been drafting at the, you know, the bottom of the first round? Michael Walker was the 19th pick in the draft. And yet, you know, look what he was able to do. Or Shelby Miller, I think, was the 14th pick. So they're not getting the, the top five picks, yet they're getting impact players. And so, you know, part of it is their scouting philosophy and how they really do they invest in that and what kind of people do they have in those positions. But it's also once they get in the organization, how good are they at developing the players? And so, you know, you see some teams like the Astros, they're consistently drafting the top five, and yet where's the impact talent? It just isn't there. So... You know, I think there are teams like the Cardinals, the Red Sox, you know, teams that are that are able to be competitive at the major league level and also still have a really deep minor league system. Those, to me, are the organizations that are kind of the gold standard. Yeah, I mean, the only problem with picking St. Louis minor leaguers now is that they've done such a great job that those guys are blocked. Yeah, absolutely. Although, you know, the interesting thing is that there's potential, you know, profit there because the perception is that they're blocked, yet they, they've done a pretty decent job of working some of those guys in. You know, I think about the trades that they made in the offseason this year. Half of it's with with the mind that these, you know, that they're going to need to create some openings to get second base to get Colton Wong in there. And so they're, they're pretty savvy about when they, you know, or something like Trevor Rosenthal, you know, it looked like he was blocked and now he's the closer. So they figure out ways to, to work those guys into the lineup more effectively than you might think going into spring training. Right. Well, and they also do a good job, partly because they have so much talent, I think, they don't rush these guys up and then kind of right. burn them out and almost destroy their career. You, you know, some of these other teams, they bring guys up when they're really not ready and they blow their confidence so much, it's they're 28 before they finally figure it out. Yeah, no, and that's right. The Cubs have a really deep organization, but they have a really bad track record with bringing out prospects and, and making them you know, turn into effective major league players. And so, you know, given how bad their major league roster looks like it's going to be this year, it, there's going to be a lot of pressure on them to bring up some of these, you know, can't miss prospects. And are they really going to be ready? So I think you have to you have to worry about that. I'd almost rather get you know a guy like Stephen Vistotti from St. Louis who, who looks like there's no way he's going to get any outfield time in St. Louis and and like stash that guy away and and hope that somehow he does. Then really overbid on a, a Cubs prospect that you you really don't know what kind of situation they're going to come into. Yeah, I mean, most keeper leagues, certainly in score sheet leagues, and I, I think most of the ones I know the rules, it's pretty cheap to keep a guy as long as he maintains his minor league status. So right. 
if you get a guy like Piscotty, like you said, at least it doesn't cost you much if you have to hold on to an extra year. But right. you take a guy and then he comes up and he gets enough yeah. playing time, he loses his minor league status, but he kind of stinks. Then you don't want to yeah. protect him next year as one of your regular keepers, and then you you got to let him go for nothing. That's the worst case scenario is that the teams to come up and let somebody learn on the job, and uh, and they're just killing you, and you can't you know you feel like you can't really cut bait on the guy because you know, he's a can't miss prospect, and you keep waiting. Like maybe next month will be the month that he turns things around, and you know ends up uh, losing 19 games or something like that. You know? Yeah, or batting 220 and getting 400 right. at bats for you, and that just killing you. Yeah. I mean, that's that's one thing about bad players. It's one thing if you have a guy that gets hurt, because at least then you get to play his replacement. His, you know, yeah. you have a sub. But the guy that really killed people last year wasn't a Tulowitzki getting hurt. It was B.J. Upton getting 500 plate appearances right. and, <laughs> and sticking with him all 500 plate appearances while he hit 180 or whatever. Yeah, and, you know, and especially if it's an auction draft, you could, I mean, you could end up spending a lot of money, like, on a, you know, a, a prospect like uh, Jose Abreu, you know, thinking that he's going to be the, the White Sox starting first baseman and get good power numbers in Cuba. And then if he doesn't produce, you know, you, you're really stuck. I often think it's better for, for a player not to win a starting job out of spring training. And it decreases his, you know, his, his perceived value at, at the draft. And then you can get the guy and stash him away. And then sometimes it's easier to come up in, in June or something and, and make an impact then as opposed to all the spotlights on the player at spring training and, you know, into the first month of the season. Sometimes guys get off to a really bad start for the event. Yeah, and once you get off to a bad start in the major leagues and you're only like 22, 23, which is pretty young, it, it, it's hard, I think, to really get it together that year. Yeah. Pretty, it oftentimes leads to an entire lost year. Yeah. No, and look at something like Alex Gordon, how long did, you know, the, the Royals brought him up really early, and how many, it took him like at least three years to sort of figure things out, right? Yeah. No, it, these guys, I mean, that's kind of the, the post-hype sleeper. The, yeah. A lot of cases, it's just because they got brought up so early. And I think pitchers, you know, it can't be good, very good for your confidence. You come up to the majors, you don't have any confidence in your curveball, and you just start right. getting shelled by major league hitters. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I always tread carefully with guys like that. But then you see somebody like Michael Walker or Jose Fernandez last year, and that's where the temptation is. Because then you want to be, you want to find the next guy like that. But the reality is, there's far more guys that struggle when they come up than you know end up being like Jose Fernandez when they come up. Yeah, I mean, if a major league professional scouting organization that has a half dozen guys doing this 40 hours a week, they miss on yeah. more guys than they hit. So. Right. I think the average fantasy player sometimes thinks, oh, yeah, I really want the next Jose Fernandez. I'm going to trade my three stars for a bunch of prospects, and then right. they all flop. Right. Yep, absolutely. What do you think about Fernandez? think he's going to have a sophomore slump or think he'll continue? No, I think he'll continue. I think he's he's mature beyond his years and seemed pretty unflappable last year, and it was pretty consistent, I think, from the first half to the second half. And so – I don't think maybe even look better in the second half. So I don't see any reason to think that, that he's going to struggle. I mean, he, he had pitched enough innings that it wasn't like the, the league didn't get a chance to sort of get a read on him and figure out was there a weakness or some way to, you know, to attack what he's doing. I mean, it's always a chance he's going to regress a little bit. I certainly don't think he's going to do what he did last year. But, you know, people said that about Mike Trout. So, and, you know, his second <laughs> year was, was pretty good. So, like, somebody like Shelby Miller really was, was not as effective in the second half as he was in the first half. So there you might worry a little bit more about regression, but when Fernandez was, looked, you know, he looked probably as dominant as he ever did in September before they shut him down. I guess I wouldn't worry too much about a sophomore slump with him. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point. I think for young guys that are just going through the majors for their first year, looking at second half stats is a good idea because if they have a hole in their swing or something about their pitching delivery, the major leaguers might catch up in the second half. Whereas right. I got to admit for veteran players that have been around for seven, six, eight years, I really don't worry too much about first half, second half. I look at their whole body of work. But. Yeah. No, because, you know, I mean, those guys are much more likely to be injured or to be, you know, to have something going on and you're not going to hear about it as much. So I agree. I think I think sometimes second half, you know, those, those kinds of things, those split stats are overused. But I do think in the case of rookies, I think it can be fairly telling sometimes. Yeah. Well, along with writing for the website for Baseball HQ, you've been, for the last three, four years since Derek McCamey left, you've been in charge of the – the minor league handbook that you guys come out with, which I just got my copy in the mail about 10 days ago. It's a fun book to work on. We cover about a thousand, actually over a thousand prospects. And this year, I think we had five people working on it. So we really put a lot of time and effort into it. And basically, we look at the same metrics of the minor league stats. And so equalizing for levels that the players are at and uh, 
and kind of comparing the stats and what they mean using some of the metrics that we use at Baseball HQ and then, and then providing a brief scouting report in each of the players. And then, of course, we have, you know, like top 15 from each organization, top power hitters and top speed prospects and, and pretty detailed analysis of the minor leagues. Well, what I really like, because I'm always kind of stressed for time a little, I like that kind of double grade you give people where you, you give a grade that shows kind of what their ceiling is, and then you give yeah. a second grade that shows what you think the odds are of them reaching that ceiling. I think that's really at the crux of what we're doing. Obviously, the scouting report gives a more detailed analysis of that, but you know, that's really trying to give, give people a shorthand for saying this player might have you know all-star potential, but there's so much work to be done here that it's a 10% chance that he's actually going to reach that potential. So you really want to look for a guy that maybe is like, a, you know, we do one through 10, so somebody who's maybe a nine, and then maybe is it like a C ranking and there's a 50% or, or better chance that he's going to reach that potential. So those are the guys that, uh, you know, I think you really want to look at and target as opposed to somebody who might, you know, have Hall of Fame potential, but <laughs> there's so much work to do that there's a good chance they're never going to reach that potential. Right, maybe they're a power hitter that they just swing for the fences every Start time, out, so uh, if they figure out how to connect, they'll be, yeah. Right. Willie McCovey, yeah. but if they don't, they'll just strike out a lot. Right. Now, the book is, like you said, the scouting things. I mean, I try to read the scouting notes about when I have time and for my favorite players, but if you're in a hurry, that little 8C yeah. or 9A or whatever is a great little quick tool. Yeah, it, yeah that's, that's what we designed it for, and uh, hopefully that works for folks. Yeah, and then, so various leagues, I know that, i, I got to admit, I'm not really a minor league expert by any means. There are some leagues, though, where hitting stats are, are fairly inflated, and other leagues where maybe pitching stats are inflated? Oh, absolutely. Historically, the, the two most notorious hitter-friendly leagues have to be the, you know, the Cal League and the Pacific Coast League. There's a, a study out there that, that I think the average between 2010 and 2012, there were 10.7 runs scored per game in the Pacific Coast League and 10.8 runs scored per game in the Cal League, you know, which is, it's, that's, you think about it, that's, you know, almost 11 runs a game is a pretty high number there, and so you know, looking at a pitcher, you know, often organizations will that have teams that, that are in a cow, especially with the young pitcher. With the Pacific Coast League, it's a little bit different because you get a lot of journeyman pitchers at that level. But the cow, you're talking, you know, this is high end. So some of the pitchers are 18, 19 years old. And you don't want to expose a, a pitcher to that environment for a year where they're getting their, their, their brains beat out, you know, night after night. And so sometimes teams will, will send guys to the Cal League for like a month, you know, they're, especially their premium pitching prospects, have them get a sense of like, you know, here's how you have to pitch in this kind of environment, and then immediately bump them up to, to double A or something like that. But still, I think getting, if you look at a pitcher that did pitch the whole year at, in the Cal League, and he had anything like in a four, four-ish ERA, I think you have to be pretty impressed by that, especially if the strikeout to walk ratio is still pretty good. So sometimes you have to, or conversely, you know, if a hitter is just, you know, tearing it up at, we've seen tons of hitters that, you know, were tearing it up at, in, in the Cal League, and then by the time they get to double A, you know, they're, they're, they look nothing like the players that were in the Cal League. Or the same thing in the Pacific Coast League. I, I know as a Giants fan, you see some outfielder that's just yeah. pressing on the ball, and I'm like, why isn't he in left field for the Giants? And then when they finally right. bring him up, it's just, do oh, yeah, <laughs> it's just depressing. So, yeah, I yeah. think it's true that if you're one of these people that just kind of looks and at the stat straight, it's I'm in the minor leagues. You got to take them with context. Whereas, yeah, you know, there are these tools around like your book that actually give some kind of help for those of us that probably think we know more than we really do. <laughs> well, and it's also important to look at the age of the player at that level. And so, you know, if it's if it's a 22 year old at, at high A, you really want to see them be able to duplicate those results at double A. Double A is often the proving ground. You know, for one reason or another, the, the talent seems to congregate at, at, at double A. And so, you know, if you have good stats in the, in the Cal League, you really want to see the player be able to do it at double A before you're really firmly convinced. Unless the player is really young and playing against, you know, a competition that's older than, than they are. That's that's a different story. Yeah, if you're 19 and you're in double A, then, yeah. you know, if you can hold your own even, you're pretty impressive. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why you look at somebody like Miguel Sonella, you know, you look at me maybe at 250 or 260, but... You know, he was 18 going on 19 for a good chunk of the year at double A. And so, so he had the 30 home run. That's something that, that's impressive just because he's getting players that are two, three, four years older than he is. Speaking of him, you've got a couple other um, kind of gems. I mean, we've all heard of Buxton, obviously, and people like that. But maybe guys a little below the radar that you think might come up in July and help fill a hole when you've got injuries? 
Yeah, and I think it'd be interesting. I mean, one of the ways to look at it is is looking at opportunity. And so somebody like the Cubs, you know, we've mentioned before that they have a pretty deep organization. And, you know, I I think for good or bad, I think they're going to, at some point, they're going to, this year, probably around June, they're going to probably bring up their, some of their top prospects. And so most people probably are, or you heard of Javier Baez, but, you know, Chris Bryant, the guy that they drafted last year, second overall pick in the draft, had just a fantastic debut. And, you know, I mean, the college guy, he hasn't had much time in the minors, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see them bring him up and have him play third base. It's not like they've got anything that's great shakes at third base right now. Or maybe even somebody like C.J. Edwards, who they traded for last year. Uh, it's a really skinny, lanky pitcher, but has really good stuff and had a lot of strikeouts last year. Um, so, you know, in the Cubs, you got to figure there's going to be some opportunities for playing time. You know, in all likelihood, anybody that they have that's any good by June or July, they're going to be looking to trade. The other thing is you can look at a good organization. So, you know, like Atlanta, it looks like this guy, Tommy Lestella, who's never been a, a top prospect, has a career minor league line of 327 batting average with 412 on base percentage. And, you know, they're talking about him getting a look at second base at the starting job. In Atlanta, you know, if Ozzy doesn't, doesn't pan out. So something like that is going to be a little bit under the radar, but he might be a really good investment just because he's got a track record of hitting and the, and the Braves have a track record of being able to work these players into their organization effectively. And he's not going to cost, I mean, if you're in an auction draft, he's a dollar end player. And if you're in a score sheet or regular straight draft, he's a, a pick right. on the last round of the draft. Yeah, especially if he doesn't win the starting job in spring training, right? If it looks like Buggles didn't get the first shot at it, then interest is going to go down in him. If he's named the starting second baseman for Atlanta, then his price obviously goes up substantially. But if he isn't, then you know, people might lose interest in him. You might be able to grab something like that pretty cheap. Huh. Well, knowing you're out there in um, Michigan, so you're close to Detroit, one of the guys yeah. I've been wondering a lot about this year, he's not really a below-the-radar minor leaguer, is Castellana not Castellanos? Yeah. You know, yeah, I'm trying to stumble over. Do you think he's going to be able to field and, well, and hit well enough to hold down the starting third base job? I think he has to. I don't really know what the other options are. The Tigers are not one of those organizations. I think in our book we ranked them dead last in terms of the depth of the organization. So I don't really know what the other options are. I guess you could move Miguel Cabrera back to third base at midpoint of the season, but look how that played out last year. I mean, it was it was pretty ugly at times at third base defensively. At least you know I was you can you can he won his bat in the lineup every day. But not only did it take a toll physically, but he just was, he just had no range at all. It's either going to be boom or bust. I mean, either you're looking at a guy who gets 500 at bats and hits 230 with no power, or he's going to accumulate some pretty decent stats in that lineup, depending on where he hits. So I think he's a risky investment. I think, you know, he, he looked over match last year. He, I've seen him play numerous times in the minors, and he's got a nice swing. It's kind of a handy swing, and so it's, it's a little bit funky. But he makes good contact and uses the whole field, and I like his approach, but you know, he's gotten being thrust into a situation where you're talking about a World Series contending team and he's going to be the starting third baseman under the spotlight. And if he doesn't hit, the Tigers really are, are, are I think, in a little bit of trouble in terms of defending the American League Central. I like him long term, but I would be fairly nervous about banking on him in the short term. I'm glad to hear you say that because that was actually I was arguing with a friend and whatever he says, I have to say the opposite. And... <laughs> That was kind of my point. He strikes me as a guy that, you know, you're liable to draft him, and then you think, okay, I got my third baseman. I won't take another yeah. one. And now you're stuck with him for 500 at-bats, kind of like the Tigers are. And yeah, it seems like, I don't know, he didn't seem great. Didn't Detroit have maybe the worst infield defense last year or yeah. the last oh, 50 yeah. years of a major league team? Yeah, it was horrible. I mean, they, you know, they were, they were playing for all that shortstop and yeah. fielder at first base. And, you know, finally it was really the only one that had any, any range at all. Poor Doug Fister and uh, Rick Porcello throwing all these ground balls <laughs> when he's getting them. Yeah, I think some of the Detroit pitchers actually might have their numbers do a little better this year. Of course, poor Fister, that was a very yeah. strange trade. It, it seems like they yeah. could have found a third baseman for Fister. I mean, he's a major league, very successful pitcher. Yeah, I'm still perplexed by that trade. You know, I think the Browns could have done a good job in Detroit for the most part, but that trade was really bad. I kept waiting for something else to happen, like it was going to be part two, and they were going to sign Beltran or something like that. You know, they needed a free-up salary for that. Or, you know, and there's a lot of talk about them signing Scherzer as a long-term contract. But, again, that hasn't happened yet. And so the sister trade really is very perplexing. Well, I understand wanting to save money, but it seems like they could have found some team to give them real baseball players because his yeah. contract wasn't – not like trying to get rid of Fielder's contract, which, you know, you had to kind yeah. of do what you could do. Fister wasn't overpaid by any stretch. So, no, I don't – yeah, it did seem strange. You know, they basically got a, a minor league double-A pitcher. Lefty, you know, has good potential, and 
a journeyman kind of utility player and then a relief pitcher for him. I agree with that. They could have gotten more talent for that, at least a starting third baseman or, you know, a, a couple impact relievers or something. Yeah. Well, anyhow, so your book is out now. Folks can, they can buy it on the Baseball HQ website. They can yep. get it through Amazon. The 2014 Minor League Baseball Analyst. If you're in a keeper league and you want to read about minor leaguers, something other than just their raw stats, can't recommend that book highly enough. Well, thanks, Rob. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. It's been great. Anytime, and we'll do it again.